Good evening. evening. Turn my cell phone off. If you're visiting with us, if you have a cell phone, anyone has a cell phone, if you would please uh, disable the ringtone, that would be greatly appreciated at this time. Before we begin, we're going to have a word of prayer, and Derek Rollerson's going to lead us in that prayer. Let us pray. Holy Heavenly Father, we humbly bow before your great throne, giving you thanks for this day. Heavenly Father, we realize the blessings that you've provided to us. Heavenly Father, may we do your will, not that of our our own. May we forgive those that trespass against us. May we be the light of the world. Heavenly Father, we're mindful of those that are sick, physically sick, within the congregation. We pray thy richest blessings upon them. Please restore them back to thy health. Heavenly Father, we're thankful for the opportunity to come together to study thy word. We're thankful for the opportunity to have the fellowship within the bond here at Jacksonville. We're thankful for the church throughout the world. Heavenly Father, we're mindful of those that are outside of the body. May we do, say, teach, or show anything that that would guide those individuals back to you. Heavenly Father, we realize our charge, and may, may we always be mindful and diligent in thy work. Heavenly Father, we're thankful, most importantly, for your Son, who died at Calvary, whose blood was shed for us. We're thankful for him, and it's in his name that we pray. Amen. Sorry for the short delay. Could not get my lesson to get over on a thumb drive, period, in order to share it, but we did get that taken care of. Last week we looked at Matthew 12, 43, beginning when the unclean spirit has gone out of a man, he walketh through dry places, seeking rest, and findeth none. Then he saith, I will return into my house from whence I came out, And when he has come, he findeth it empty, swept, and garnished. So here is a parable. And within this parable, if you remember, we had a picture and the prophecy. Now, here is an evil spirit that leaves a body. That's what he's considering a, a house. He leaves it, and when he comes back, he finds it clean, right? Swept and garnished. Then goeth he and taketh with himself seven other spirits more wicked than himself, and they enter in and dwell there. So they go back into that same body and begin to dwell again. And the last state of that man, there's the body, the man. The last state of that man is worse than the first. Even so shall it be also unto this wicked generation. Now, here Jesus is talking to those Jews, and he It's a picture and a prophecy. Now, what happened in 68 to 70 A.D.? Rome was... uh, Okay, Rome destroyed Jerusalem, right? They encompassed Jerusalem. They surrounded Jerusalem. They desolated Jerusalem. And so it was this generation was very wicked, and so shall it be with this generation. The last state's going to be worse than the first with you. Now... We saw kind of a picture here. Because when you look at 2 Peter 2.20 and Matthew 12, 43 through 45, we too can be in a worse state than we were before we ever obeyed the gospel. As we looked at 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 20, for if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world, they are again entangled therein and overcome. The last state is become worse with them than the beginning or began... Uh, than the first. When you look at the parallelism here, it's quite astonishing. But then he goes on to say in 21 and 22, for it had been better for them not to have known the truth, but after they have known it, to turn from the holy commandment delivered unto them. 
And it has happened unto them according to the true proverb, the dog, again is, the, the dog is turned again to his own what? Vomit. And the sow that was washed to her wallowing in the mire. So a child of God can so sin to lose their salvation and it's worse with them than at the beginning. They had never known. So we saw some parallelism. And then we looked at a very important lesson at the very end. Keeping our eyes focused on Jesus Christ. And as such, we came away with four concluding thoughts. Look unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before Him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Look for lost souls, Acts chapter 8 and verse 4. For it was the church, those that were scattered abroad, that went everywhere preaching the word. Look for opportunities, Galatians chapter 6, verses 2 and 10. And look for the hope, Titus chapter 2 and verse 13. And our hope as children of God is what? Heaven. Heaven. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. Now, this evening, what we're going to be looking, looking at is something that transpired after this. Now, this evening, we're going to be learning a new word. I learned a new word. I was looking at my thesaurus and trying to find a word since I'm dealing with the book of Matthew and alliterating it with the letter P. Here was a, a word that began with the letter P that meant family. Never seen this word before. Some of you may have. Propinquity. Now you're going to see a word that is closely aligned with this, but this word is a very popular word. When you look it up on, on Google and look at uh, researchers and articles, but this word means close kin, blood, relation camaraderie that is very, very close and tight-knit. Now, in Matthew 12, 46, beginning, we read, while he yet talked to the people. Now, he had just, he had been talking this parable about the, the evil spirit, but now it says here, while he yet talked to the people, behold, his mother and his brethren stood without, desiring to speak with him. Then one said unto him, Behold thy mother, and thy brethren stand without desiring to speak with thee. But he answered and said unto him that told him, Who is my mother, and who are my brethren? And he stretched forth his hand toward his disciples and said, Behold my mother and my brethren. For whosoever shall do the will of my Father which is in heaven. The same is my brother and my sister and my mother. Propinquity. Close, tight-knit kinship. Now as we look at Matthew 12, 46 through 50, here are the parallels in Mark in Luke, Mark 3, 31 through 35, and Luke chapter 8, verses 19 through 21. Now, we're going to look at a little bit of a, a more full picture of something that transpired here, and it's quite interesting. When you look at Luke chapter 8 and verse 19, you see something that we see in other passages. Then came to him his mother and his brethren and could not come at him for the press. What does for the press mean? The crowd. Over and over again when Jesus is speaking, when Jesus is teaching, when Jesus is preaching, what goes right along with his teaching, speaking, and preaching? Goes hand in hand with it. Miracles. What goes hand in hand with those miracles? The crowds. The crowds. And here is Jesus doing some teaching. He had already been doing some, some healing. And now here are his family members, his physical family, his, his physical mother, Mary. And, and here are some of his brethren. Now, 
I want to point out the word brethren here could be very generic. It is used in that sense, sense, uh, sense throughout the New Testament. It can mean brothers and sisters. Over and over, the word brethren has a connotation of being both brothers and sisters in Christ. Now, when we look, they couldn't get to him for the press. Now, look at Matthew 12, 46. While he yet talked to the people, behold, his mother and brethren stood without desiring to speak. So they couldn't get to him. They wanted to speak to him. But then when you look at Mark 3, 31, and his mother and and Anne standing without, his brethren and his mother standing without, sent unto him, calling him. So they came to him. They couldn't get to him for the press. They desired to speak to him. So what did they do? Tell him, we want to speak with him. Mary may have said, tell my son that I long to speak with him. It very well could be the case that his brothers or brothers and sisters said, hey, would you please tell him to come? We can't get to him. So finally, word gets to him. Don't know if, if, if Jesus could clearly see them, but word came to him. Now, let's, let's focus in just a moment on his brothers and sisters. The next chapter, at the very end of that chapter, just like the very end of this chapter, it mentions the siblings, the half-siblings of Jesus. Now, why do I say half-siblings? His earthly father was not his father. You know, I'm often intrigued when I look at the book of Luke chapter 2 when Jesus was 12 years old and he tarried behind in Jerusalem. And finally, when Mary and Joseph came to him, Mary, after seeing him, Mary and Joseph being amazed seeing him, being in the temple, both hearing them and asking them questions, and all that heard him were astonished. And when they, Mary and Joseph, saw him, they were amazed and she went to him and she said, Son, why hast thou thus dealt with us? Why have you done this to us? Thy father and I have sought thee sorrowing. Now, who's she talking about? Joseph. I almost wonder if his words were a polite and loving correction of her question. Because his answer was this. How is it that you sought me? Wished ye not that I must be about my father's business? I believe that he was lovingly correcting her. Don't forget who I am. I've got to be about my father's business. This is why I came. Now when you go on to read, he was subject unto them. Okay? That means he went with them. They wanted him to come back in, and he did that. Now, when you look at Matthew 13, verse 55, we see something very interesting. Is not this the carpenter's son? Now here he is in Nazareth, and here they're saying, is not this the carpenter's son? Is, is not his mother called Mary? And his brethren, James, Joseph, Simon, and Judas? Now we have the names of his four brothers, right? His, his half-brothers, that is, his, his physical brothers. But then something very interesting, it says, and his what? Sisters. Are they not all with us? Whence then hath this man all these things? We know this boy. We know this man. We've known him ever since he was a young man, a boy. We've watched him in, in our air grow up. Is this not who this is? Is my memory failing me? And when you look at John chapter 7, you see something very interesting about his siblings or his half-siblings. In John chapter 7 and verse 3, his brethren, now once again, I don't know how generic this could be. This could actually mean his brothers and his what? Sisters. His brethren therefore said unto him, Depart hence and go into Judea, that thy disciples also may see the works that thou doest. For there is no man that doeth anything in secret, and he himself seeketh to be known openly. Now listen to what they say to their half-brother, to our Lord. If, if thou do these things, show thyself to the world. For neither did his brethren believe in him. James, Joseph, Simon, Judas did not believe that Jesus was who he claimed to be. 
They didn't believe in him. His sisters could not very well have believed in him either. And here we are in the book of Matthew chapter 12, and your mother and your brethren, they, they long to see you. You know what? No wonder our Lord commented as he did. And when you look at Matthew 12, 48, but he answered and said unto him that told him, Who's my mother? Who, who are my brethren? You see, his half-brothers and, and siblings apparently didn't believe who he was and who he claimed to be. Now, what's interesting? Two of the books we have in our New Testament are written by whom? James and what? Jude. are believed to have been written by two of the unbelieving. You know what that tells me about them? They ended up believing. I think that's wonderful. Now, look at verse 50. For whosoever shall do the will of my Father which is in heaven, the same is my brother and sister and mother. Look, put it like this. And he answered and said unto them, My mother and my brethren are these which hear the Word of God, and do it. You want to know who my family is. Propinquity. You want to know who I'm cl closely tight-knit with? Who I'm closer than anyone else with? And who I have such a kinship with? That it is going to be very difficult Unless they leave, it'll never be broken. Those that hear and those that do. Kinship. Today, you and I, today and in the past, have had kinships. We have been very close to people before. How many of you in here played baseball when you were in school, okay? Was there a camaraderie with the baseball team? Yeah, softball. There's a camaraderie and a closeness with baseball and softball. You, you, you eat with them, you practice with them, you run laps with them, you train with them. You lose with them. There are tears that are shed for losing. There are tears that are shed for winning. When I came here, or before I came here, I had never been a part of a congregation with such a good college group. I have seen some very close-knit kinships and friendships in this college group. Some that will last for many years. There are those that meet in this college group that later on end up getting married, right? And I've even seen some visit back, and when I go and introduce myself, they, oh, we've, we've been here before. We used to be in the college group. We, we met in the college group. We got married. These are our children. I'll, it, it's wonderful. Kinship, closeness. Firefighters. You can ask Brody, first responders, firefighters. They have a close-knit relationship. I remember being a volunteer firefighter in training, and one of the firefighters that I trained under told me, he said, I've got to tell you something about your older brother. I've got an older brother that's he's 14 years my senior, and he was a full-time firefighter. He has retired, but he said... We were fighting a house fire, and I fell through the floor. And your brother, if it had not been for him, I would have fallen on down to the first floor. I would have died. He picked me up out of that fire, out of that, out of that hole, and saved my life. I have heard firefighters tell stories, and they have seen things together that are horrific that are horrible police officers. Do they have a camaraderie and a closeness? Yeah, they do. I was a police chaplain before I came here. 
I would ride in a car with them. And I'll never forget thinking, okay, I'm new to this. What I'm going to do is, is call a member of the church who is a police officer and also a police chaplain. And he told me and, and helped me out greatly. I got in that vehicle and I was not in the squad car more than five minutes until this police officer poured his heart out to me. I was holding the tears back. He told me this. He, he kept apologizing. I'd say, do not apologize. This is why I'm here. He told me about things that he had seen. He told me about an instance where, where there was a man that was missing. His family was looking for him. And they had been looking for him. The police had all day long. And that night, at about midnight, close to midnight, he found him. The man was dressed up in a suit and a tie. He drove around. He called in, I have found him. He got out of his squad car. The man pulled out a pistol and ended his own life. Had a note. He couldn't go home and tell his wife. Couldn't tell his children. These firefighters, these first responders, they see things and... and and they have a camaraderie. They have one another. And you can see it when, when you go in and, and, and you begin to work with them. What about soldiers? Band of brothers? I remember World War II veterans and hearing them and watching them have reunions. And I have talked to some from World War II. I just preached a funeral for one not too long ago that was in World War II. And he would tell me about going overseas, going to France. And I remember him talking about the camaraderie, and, but I also remember him telling me about the things that he saw. Some things he said that they would give the soldiers chocolates to eat. Little candy bars. And he remembers going into the places that had just been bombed and the children, the hungry children would come and the soldiers would just throw out the candy to them. So that they would have something to eat. They saved one another's lives. There's a story about one soldier in World War II that... A man in his unit was left on the battlefield. You see, they had gotten out of the trench. Their commanding officer said, it's time for us to attack. Let's all move. And they all did. They went out and then he called for the retreat. He got back in the, in the trench and he saw one of his own, one of his best friends on the battlefield and the bullets were flying. The man turned and looked toward the trench. He got out of the trench. His commanding officer said, you get back. He ignored him. He went out and got to that man. Here's the words of the man. I knew you would come. He helped him off the battlefield. And it wasn't very long that the man died. But he died in his brother's arms. They have a kinship, a closeness. Today, many soldiers have the same thing. It is frozen. There we go. You have those that are in the army, the marines the Navy, the Air Force, uh, pilots, or I, I can listen to pilots talk and they talk about some, some things that they have done during wartime. And, and then you have the Coast Guard. All of these people, if you've been in the military, they have a close kinship, and I've seen it. I've heard them. You'll have to move on to the next one for me, Daniel, I think. What about school teachers? Do school teachers have a, a close kinship with one another? 
they worked with. You know, I remember when I was in school, if, if I made a bad grade or if I did something wrong and I got a paddling in school, guess what would happen when I got home? I got another one. It seems as though now, if a kid gets in trouble with school, the parent comes and does what? Choose out the teacher. <laughs> right? There is a closeness even among school teachers. And they oftentimes can lean on one another. Propinquity. You see, Jesus... Revelation 5 and verse 5 is the line of the tribe of Judah. In the book of John chapter 1 and verse 29, He is the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. As we think about Jesus Christ, maybe our minds go back to an Old Testament passage. Proverbs chapter 18 and verse 24, A man that hath friends must show himself what? Friendly. And there is... A friend that sticketh closer than a brother. What's your relationship with Jesus? Oh, okay, He's there. He hasn't moved. He is not going to budge. If anyone ceases to keep the relationship close, who does that fall on? that falls on me because Jesus is a friend that sticks closer than a brother. A matter of fact, in the book of John chapter 15 and, and verse 13, greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. You see, not only is he a friend that sticks closer to a brother, that friend loved us so much that He gave His life for you and me, thereby becoming our Savior if we hear the Word of God and what? Do it. That's when He becomes our Savior. That's when He becomes our elder brother. Now, I know it seems kind of strange to call our Lord, our Savior, our King, the head of the church, Ephesians chapter 1, 22 and 23, our elder brother. You think about the word once again, propinquity. Another word closely that, uh, that, that does align with that is proximity. Proximity. That word proximity is within the meaning of propinquity. How close are you to Jesus? Jesus is there. And if we hear the word of God and we do it, He becomes our elder brother. Oh, sure, He's our Lord. He's our Savior. But I want you to take note of some beautiful passages concerning the close, tight-knit kinship we can have with Jesus Christ. You see, when he was born, he was born as a man. Now, we'll get to that in a moment. Look at Hebrews chapter 2, verse 11. For both he that sanctifieth and they who are sanctified are all of one, for which cause he is not ashamed to call them what? Jesus sanctifies... We're the sanctified. And He is not ashamed to call us what? Brethren. Who's His brethren? Who's His family? Who are those that are in close proximity to Him? Those that are tightly wound together in His life with Him. That are tight-knit, kin. Those that hear and do. Romans 8, 29, For whom He did foreknow... He also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of His Son, that He might be the firstborn among many, what? Jesus Christ was the first, firstborn from the dead to what? Never die again. Now, 
Mark 3, 35, For whosoever shall do the will of God, the same is my brother and my sister and my mother. If we hear and we do, Jesus Christ is not only our Lord, not only is He our Savior, He is our elder brother. Galatians chapter 4, and I told you we'd get to this, but when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth His Son made of a woman, made under the law. So Jesus left heaven, came to earth. He was born of a woman to redeem them that were under the law that we might receive the what? Adoption of sons. And because ye are sons, God hath sent forth the Spirit of His Son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Now notice this. Wherefore thou art no more a servant, but a son. So I want to pause here. If we're a son, who's our father? God, right? But if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. You know what that means? We're a joint heir with who? Jesus Christ. He is our elder brother. You think about the camaraderie we ought to have with one another. It's in Timothy chapter 2, verses 3 and 4. Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. Now this was Paul writing to a young preacher by the name of Timothy. But in the book of Ephesians chapter 6, beginning with about verse 10, we have the Christian armor. And friends, we are all soldiers of Christ. We are co-laborers. 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 9, For we are laborers together with God. Ye are God's husbandry. Ye are God's building. We are God's people. We have a Lord and a Savior. And we have an elder brother. And we, we ought to be just as close-knit as Jesus was with His disciples. We're brothers and we're sisters in Christ. We go through things that the worldly-minded person does not go through because they, some, some of them do not care. Some of them do not believe in, in God. They do not believe that there's a heaven. They do not believe that there's an earth that when they die, they're just like a dog, the dog rover. They're dead all over. They have no place to go after death, right? And they live in the filth and the mire of sin. And then when we're tempted by it, it's a struggle for us. Not for them, but it is for us. And when we go through those struggles, ought we to help one another? Ought we? Galatians chapter 6 and verse 2, Bear ye not one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. Oh, sure, we can go to the Word of God, and we ought to go to the Word of God, but we ought to be striving together, studying together, worshiping together, praying together. We are family. Propinquity. Proximity. You know what strengthens me? When you're here. When I see your face, when I hear your voice. And the other night, I, I, I stood up here and, and I heard the, the singing is so beautiful here at Jacksonville. I love it. The closeness that this congregation have has truly astonished me since I've been here. I love each and every one of you. I love each and every member. I love the eldership, the deacons, the teachers, the college group, the, the, the high school group, the children, everyone that is here. I love you dearly. May we help one another get to heaven and let us remember if we're going to stay close to one another, first and foremost, we may stay, we must stay close to our elder brother. And who is that? But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another.
and the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanseth us from our sins. May God help us to help one another get to heaven. Thank you for your time.
That's Blue Skies and Rainbows. And if you're using a book, our invitation song will be number 465. 465 will be the invitation song. Blue skies and rainbows and sunbeams from heaven are what I can see. When my Lord is living in me, I know that Jesus is well and alive today. He makes his home in my heart. Never more will I be all alone since he promised me that we never would part. Tall mountains, green valleys, the beauty that surrounds me all make me aware of the one who made it all. I know that Jesus is well and alive today. He in my heart, never more will I be all alone since he promised me that we never would part. There we go. Eyes on Christ. This is an image that we looked at a moment ago. And consider some thoughts about looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. There was joy in him going to Calvary. What possible joy would there be in going through the sufferings that Jesus went through? What kind of joy would there possibly be in knowing that he was not only going to be mocked, that he was going to be blindfolded, that he was going to be hit across the face, that his, the very hairs of his beard were, were going to be plucked out? Not only that, that he was going to be scourged with a Roman scourge and his back bloody, bruised, and open. Then he was to be taken and nailed to an old rugged cross. What kind of joy would there possibly be in a man knowing that he was about to go through this? What possible joy did Jesus have knowing that he was about to go through all that he went through? because of what it meant for you and for me. Now tonight in the adult class, we looked at a word, propinquity. One that is closely aligned with this word is proximity, closeness, kinship, blood relative, and camaraderie that is so very close. And we also took note of the camaraderie that maybe people have in their, in their lives. Our children sometimes have a close kinship and relationship and even get almost as close to their friends that maybe they endure training and, and things with than they do their own family members. And then we consider Jesus. Proverbs chapter 18 and verse 24, A man that hath friends must show himself friendly, and there is a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. That friend, I submit to you, is the one that saw joy in going to Calvary. When we think about Jesus, our elder brother, you need to realize something. He is not only our Lord, not only our Savior, but those that are in Christ, he is our brother. But for Christ to be our elder brother, there are some, some things that, that we have to do. In Luke 8, 21, 
we see a parallel to the book of Matthew chapter 12. Here, Mary and Jesus' brethren came to him, but they couldn't get to him because of the crowd. And so what happened, they sent word. And someone said, hey, your mother and your brethren are wanting to speak to you. He says, who's my mother? Who's my brethren? And then he goes on to say, and he answered and said unto them, my mother and my brethren are these which hear the word of God and do it. Propinquity. You want to know who I am kin to? You want to know who my relatives are? Those who I am tightly related to and, and have such a kinship with? It's those that hear the word of God and do it. That's who I'm an, el uh, an elder brother to. When we think about Jesus, our Savior, He is only our Savior when we hear and we do. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 23 and 25, we're going through verse 25. When, when you look at verse 25, husbands love your wives even as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. Jesus died for the church. So if we're to hear the word of God and do it, what about salvation? Hear. Luke chapter 8, verse 21, They that hear the word of God and do it, we must first hear. Romans 10, 17, So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. We must believe. In the book of John chapter 8, and verse 24, Verily I say unto you, that ye shall die in your sins. For if ye believe not that I am he, ye shall die in your sins. We must believe that Jesus Christ was who he claimed to be. But you know where many stop, our Lord keeps going in his word. In the book of Luke chapter 13, verses 3 and 5, our Lord makes it abundantly clear, except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. He says that both in verse 3 and verse 5. A change of mind. That's what repent means. Metaneo in the Greek. A change of mind that results in the way that you're living your life. I'm no longer, you resolve in your mind, no longer to live in sin, but now to live for Jesus. But where many people will stop, our Lord continues to go. In the book of Matthew 10, 32 and 33, our Lord says, Whosoever shall confess me before men, him will I confess before my Father which is in heaven. But whosoever shall deny me before men, him will I deny also before my Father which is in heaven. We look at this and we see this and we understand this and many people today will agree wholeheartedly and will give us a hearty amen. Yes, this is what one must do in order to be saved. But where they will stop, our Lord continues on. Because you see, He didn't stop there. There's one more thing. Oh, it's the very act that puts one into Christ. In the book of Mark chapter 16, verse 16, Jesus Christ said, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. You want to know where we come in contact with the blood of Jesus? It's in the watery grave of baptism. In the book of Galatians chapter 3, verses 26 and 27, For ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. You see, we're baptized, we are baptized into Christ. Now listen to Ephesians 1 and verse 7. In whom, that's in Christ, we have redemption through His blood, even the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of His grace. If you're here this evening and you believe that Jesus Christ was who He claimed to be and you're willing right now to repent of your sins, confessing Christ before, before us this very hour, why not, oh, why not tonight Obey the gospel of our Lord and our Savior by being baptized for the remission of sins, Acts 2.38. To be baptized in order to be saved, Mark chapter 16 and verse 16. 
That very act that puts us into Christ puts us in contact with the blood of Christ. Are you ready? It may be that you are here this evening and you've already been baptized and, and Jesus Christ could be counted as your elder brother, but you strayed from the family. You're a lost sheep of the house of God and of the fold of Christ. Don't you think that it's time that you come back to the Lord? James tells us, confess your faults one to another and pray for one for another that you may be healed. The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. If you're subject to the Lord's invitation, please make yourself right with God. While together we stand and we sing. Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you fully trusting in His grace this hour? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you washed in the blood in the soul? Cleansing blood of the Lamb. All your garments spotless, are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Lay aside the garments that are stained with sin and be Appreciate you all being here with us tonight for our Bible study. A few announcements and reminders before we uh, leave this evening. Uh, first and foremost, we, we have a new brother in Christ, Evan Summers. We, we rejoice uh, that he put on Christ in baptism in, on Sunday. And uh, we, we will pray for Evan and, and hope that he has a long and uh, useful life in the Lord's service. Uh, the birthday cake fellowship will be tonight. After services, that, that will take place in the fellowship building to celebrate those with a January birthday. Uh, prime timers will meet next Thursday, uh, January 12th at 6 o'clock. Uh, there will be soup, chilies, and desserts. Uh, please bring your favorite game to that. Uh, the JCSC sign-up to cook a meal for the college students is in the back. Uh, please sign up to provide a meal uh, for, the, for the college group on a Monday night. Uh, there's a youth calendar in the back as well, parents, grandparents, youth. Please pick up a copy of the calendar for 2023. Uh, that is there in the back. There are some folks that we need to remember in our prayers. Uh, please continue to pray for Cheryl Hall and for James Couch. Uh, that's all the announcements that I have. Uh, I think Blake may have, Blake does not have an announcement this time. Uh, we'll be led in a closing song, and then Jacob Brown will lead us in a closing prayer. Let's sing number 77. 77, we'll sing the first verse only. If you will, please stand and remain standing for the closing prayer. We'll sing the first verse only. Anywhere with Jesus I can safely go. Anywhere he leads me in this world below. Anywhere without him dearest joys would fade. Anywhere with Jesus I am not afraid. Anywhere, anywhere, fear I cannot know. Anywhere with Jesus I 
I can safely go. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this day and all the blessings you've blessed us with. Thank you for, for letting us gather here today so we can learn more about you. Be with the sick and those dealing with the loss of loved ones. And be with us as we leave. Keep us safe and let's be in a Christian example to the world and help us to assemble at the next point of time. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. <laughs>